Yep. He's downstairs. Okay, everyone, we've reached the witching hour. Shall we uh, get started? Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? No, there are no changes. None? Are there any declarations of interest? I am. You're interested in being here on a Friday, right? Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> you're the only one. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Pearson, Partridge on the motion. All in favor? Carry. No, there are no declarations. You have before you the minutes of our January the 23rd. Is there any errors, omissions, or questions? Failing that, move by Pearson. Second by Partridge. On the motion. Carry. Item 4, Mike Zagarek, would you please walk us through the presentations on 4.1 and 4.2, or at least introduce them. Yeah. So, so Chad? Chad? Is that Chad? You? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a chair with your name on it. I said, said Mike. <laughs> 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 jo Joey wants to make a note that you're in attendance. So, uh, All right. Okay. So it's actually. Yeah. Ozzy hasn't complained of getting his bald spot. Sorry. Usually you always get the back of my head in all the meetings. So. You're talking about bald nice. spots. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is a deep forehead. <laughs> I'm trying to find a hair spot. Michael, back to you before, before this thing just denigrates you. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Ken yeah. and, yeah. and I have to Nobody talk about our barbers. <laughs> I need a referral. <laughs> uh, nice haircut, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that, so it's actually uh, my pleasure to identify that. I won't be doing all the speaking today, but Jay will actually uh, be presenting the Web Redevelopment Project. Is this something we said yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or the length of speaking yesterday. <laughs> uh, so Jay is actually the project lead on the Web Redevelopment pro uh, Project. And so uh, Jay will provide uh, you a presentation on an update on the web uh, redevelopment project, and uh, I will provide uh, a short presentation on the call handling review, uh, leading into uh, discussion item 5.1, which is uh, we were directed at the last subcommittee meeting to come back with some proposed amendments to the terms of reference to uh, include the call handling review within the scope of the subcommittee's work. And so again, I'll have a short presentation 4.2 that speaks to call handling and uh, draws uh, some attention to the synergies between the call handling review and the web redevelopment project. So I can pass it on to Jay, Jay. the chair. Thank you. Thank you. So at our last uh, meeting, uh, we had talked about some of the things we'd be bringing forward today. So we're going to give you a quick update on the project. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the AODA compliance regulations and what those will mean for us going forward. Uh, we're going to, Ken is going to give uh, an overview of advertising options. So we've been asked to look at advertising potential for the city's website. And then it will get back to me to talk about uh, the online services. So we talked about how we come to talk about the top five online services and how we chose those. Some information about the transaction fees we charge on our website, and that's a discussion about where we're headed next, next meetings. So, the, uh, as we've talked about before, the web technology assessment, uh, the RFP proposals have been evaluated, and the preferred, preferred proponent has been selected. And uh, we're still sort of in the midst of just working through some of those procurement pieces, so we'll have uh, hopefully more information that we can announce shortly. Uh, the process going forward will include. So, sorry, Jason. So, until. The T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. You uh, you can't uh, advise us of who the, uh, the preferred proponent is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the evaluations were completed, and once the cost proposal was open, uh, IBM has been identified as a uh, selection for preferred. Okay. At this point, we just have not yet moved to award until the I's are dotted. And okay. Across. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah. 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 And and it, the proposal was received within budget. So yes. very good news. Uh, we had seven. Seven one was disqualified or mm -hmm. two potential. Yeah, that's good. That was seven. <clears throat> so uh, the the vendor that we do end up working with, they'll be coming in to understand how the city has been doing its web development over the past several years, some of the challenges we've had, as well as where we're going in the future, looking at our technology needs uh, into the future. Uh, they'll also be looking at other municipalities. We'll be identifying some ones that we've heard are doing some really innovative things that are either cost savings or improvements to service for citizens. So we'll want to look at how those are working in those communities to see if there's anything we can learn from them. 
and there will be some focused public consultation with interested stakeholders in the community just to be aware of what uh, community members would like to see in our web technology heading into the future, recognizing that the technology platform, the development we choose now, will be living with that for several years to come, so we want to make sure we definitely make the best of choice there. It is a very tight timeline for this RFP work because we definitely want to get on to the business of actually getting the technology in and, and begin working on that so that we can continue to meet our, our tight timelines for the project. So uh, I think that work is underway and we'll be definitely be continuing to uh, keep the subcommittee updated on that work. Other work that's been taking place. Sure, uh, Excuse me, just on process, would uh, we prefer to wait to the end of the presentation for questions or kind of as we go along? Start have some segments throughout yeah. the presentation. So let's wait. So, so, what, so why don't you, when you get to those gaps, Jay, you just plain indicate that. Uh, that uh, That's great. Yeah, okay, anyway. thank you. Okay, sounds thank good. Thank you. Uh, so, just to let you know about some of the other work we've been doing, we've been working with the HSR, the project team in HSR, as we identified that was the first service that we were looking at to make sure there's some improvements for citizens there. So, we've been doing some work in that area. We've also been working with cross departmental teams to do deep content review, a cleanup exercise, and getting ready for the data compliance that we're going to be rolling out. And then some training with staff, particularly around ADA compliance and what it means and some of the, the people that will be involved in ensuring that we get that compliance. So that's sort of a, a quick update on, on what the team is going to be doing. Some questions at this point, Judy? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just um, on the public consultation, can you expand on, on that? <coughs> the time frame is quite tight, but I just think that's hugely important that we, that we there's so much interest out there that, uh, can you just expand on what the, that process will look like? Sure. So uh, we've had our public information session that took place in February. That was the first uh, introduction to the community about the strategy and, and what it means. We invited uh, folks to come in and talk to staff about it. Uh, we had some good response from different staff and, uh, or sorry, different citizens, actually some staff as well, uh, as well as some service providers in the community, some local service providers that might want to be involved in the project. The advisory committee for persons with disabilities was also in attendance. Uh, so it was a good mix of people that we were able to connect with. Uh, certainly the ones that signed up for more information and want to be pro part of the process going forward will definitely be in touch with them. What we envisioned for the technology assessment piece, we want it because of the tight timelines and it is very focused on the technology, there will be other public consultations throughout the process around other aspects of the project. But this is strictly to understand interested community members and probably local developers, the local development community, the local open data community, get a sense of what they might want the city to do going forward and how they might want to interface, looking at innovative opportunities to collaborate with the universities and colleges, uh, some of those things that have been happening in other communities we want to have an eye towards those. We envision it probably will be one or two public meetings uh, and we will do some good outreach to uh, local stakeholders to make sure they're aware of the opportunity to come in and provide that feedback for, with, uh, for us. And uh, we wanted the a successful proponent in the RFP to do that work just so that it was a very objective analysis of what they hear back so they can provide that information back to staff and subcommittee. And I think that sort of covers off what well, we did. There may be, uh, depending on what the vendor suggests, there may be a follow-up survey as well that we do just to get a very good data analysis of what the community wants. So there'll be the qualitative feedback sessions as well as good data analysis on that. Okay, thank you. That I really appreciate that. I know that um, when, when you say cross-department <coughs> consultation, it, all departments, so recreation would be one. Absolutely. Because um, I did have a meeting with user groups for ICE time uh, earlier this week, and one of their biggest complaints was you can go on Burlington's website, you can fill out what your uh, requests are for additional ICE time, and you can pay for it, and it's all done on, online. Whereas with Hamilton, it's a very onerous paper fill-out, and if you're on your iPhone and you're trying to book space, etc. So as long as I hear some assurance that we're going to be reaching out and consulting with the user groups as well or through recreation, that uh, seems to be a, a hot button um, within the last, uh, certainly within the season. So thank you for that. So through you, Mr. Chair, the uh, recreation is one of the other five that has been identified and, and in that process we would definitely be looking at what requests have been coming from uh, both their, the, sort of the people that use our facilities for our facility rentals as well as community members, what the requests are for coming in, and that certainly is one of the items that might be. Thank you very much. Further Okay, thank you. Continue. 
Thank you. So moving on to the uh, AODA component, so just to give you a brief uh, summary of what AODA, specifically the web AODA requirements, are going to entail. So the deadline for us is the end of this year, it's January 1, 2014. Uh, the city's website must meet, a, what, that's an international standard, a web content accessibility guideline, or CAG level 2 is what they refer to it as. Uh, there's quite, there's uh, hundreds of uh, guidelines of technical details that you have to accomplish in order to meet that level. Um, some of them are very simple and some of them are more complex. But what's included for us is that all the city's website properties, all of our web content and our web applications that were created or substantially changed at the beginning of last year. So there's a two year window where we have to go back and, and retrofit during that time. And then everything from January 1, 2014 onwards, we have to ensure that it is compliant right off the bat. It includes web applications we control directly or through a contractual obligation. So for instance, our HSR service, our recreation services, we purchase software that comes in and we use that software to deliver the service. We need to ensure that that software is also AOD compliant with the same legislation. And by and large, those service providers work with a lot of government organizations, so they are already mapping to those AOD requirements themselves as well. And just to give you a flavor um, of what is included in AOD, because I think oftentimes it's very easy to talk about a low vision or a no vision user and their experience, um, but there, there is much broader discussion around uh, people with disabilities. So this slide shows some of the things that we'll need to do. But in summary, we are looking at working with people with low or no vision, people with low or no hearing, people that uh, use an assistive device for mobility. So for instance, some people only use a keyboard or only use a mouse, or they may even have assistive devices that they use to help them navigate through a website. Some people may have difficulties with fine motor control, and so they may be shaking as their hand is moving through mouse clips and those sorts of things. Uh, there are people also with cognitive disabilities, and so we need to think about how we can make the information that we have on our website as simple for people to understand as possible. And there are, there are people with temporary disabilities as well, so people that have maybe broken an arm recently or are suffering from an illness. And so we need to sort of think about a broad spectrum of how people with disabilities, uh, long-term disabilities and short-term disabilities would interact with our website to make sure that it's accessible for them. <laughs> So this list sort of speaks to some of the other things. It's uh, broader than just the ensuring that the images on our site, for instance, have a text alternative. That's sort of an obvious one. But it's about providing enough time for people to move through our services and our online systems. Some of them have timeouts that we need to think about whether that timeout is enough for a person with a disability. And similar to Ticketmaster, you don't want to boot a person out before they've been able to complete that task. So there's quite a few uh, pieces to that video, for instance, has to have a transcript or closed captioning included in it so that people with no vision can access that information as well. So it's, it's broad, there are some simple pieces around font size and, and that sort of thing that I think a lot of people understand. But there are many other pieces to it that require more nuanced activity around it. And uh, just one more slide on the AOD, and then I'll have some questions. Uh, so the activities that we are undertaking, we're currently doing an assessment, so we're in the what's our current state of affairs right now. We're assessing all of our website content and online services, determining which websites can be consolidated together. So we have some small websites that are out there that we think if we bring them into the bigger picture, it will be easier to make sure the whole collection is AOD compliant. There will be some websites that remain separate, of course, and we'll need to think about how those are treated separately with AOD compliance. Looking at all of our contents, we have a lot of content, as we've mentioned before, and we're trying to simplify that. We want to simplify it in a way we don't lose any information by providing all of that service and content to citizens, but in a way that's much simpler to maintain and go through and do the AOD exercise. And looking at all of our online services and applications that we contract through a third party and ensuring that we're able to ensure the compliance there. We expect that to take place over the next couple of months. We're currently doing that work. And then the next work will be to go through that, all of that material and make it accessible where it's currently not accessible. And there's quite a lot of detail behind those activities, but they would never take, we expect probably till about September, possibly October. And then we'll be doing some testing towards the end of this year, just to make sure that we've hit the mark. So there's technical tools that we'll assess for our compliance, and we'll also be working with people with disabilities to ensure that their experience is a positive one. 
And from that, forward, that point forward, it'll be about keeping it accessible, which speaks to good governance in the organization, making sure that we have the skills and the people committed and dedicated to doing this on an ongoing basis. So I think I'll pause there, just on the AOPA, if there's any questions. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. The, uh, <coughs> the Web Contact Accessibility Guidelines, is that just provincial at this time, or is that federal? Uh, so there are a number of different legislations here, Mr. Chair. Uh, AODA is a provincial legislation, and that is the one we're mapping to. In the U.S., there's uh, Section 508 is what they use, and then the federal government in Canada also has a standard that they use. By and large, they're all using the same worldwide standard, though, so we're all mapping to the same thing. The, the detail is what's included and what isn't included changes by jurisdiction, and so we'll be mapping to the detail around the AODA because obviously that's the one we can play. And, and my second question was, with regards to um, other applications that we purchase, different programs that we purchase, depending where they come from anywhere in the world, we can't guarantee though, I guess going forward, they will start meeting these requirements which will simplify things for us. But we, don't, we won't be at that point right off the bat. Uh, through Mr. Vera, that's correct. So some of the, most of the services that we use are be, being used by the, uh, within the US, for instance, where there's a very large market. And the US actually was way ahead in terms of having the regulation around it. So they are, there is fairly good compliance with those systems already, although there is work we have to do to ensure that's the case. And so we think we're okay, but there definitely will be some areas where we have to make a question about this isn't compliant. The legislation does provide an exemption for that, so there's, it's where practicable. If we have a really good justification for why that isn't compliant, we're going to be looking at plans for how we make it compliant into the future, and we think that that should allow us to still be within our compliance, but obviously the test of the legislation will be the court cases that may happen down the road might get clarification about what's included. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. So Jay, could I suggest that uh, I'm assuming that the ward counselors who have web pages, they must be AODA compliant by the date in question. I would suggest that an information uh, sheet uh, with the uh, called evolving requirements be sent out to the counselors and their AAs soonest so that we can get ahead of the curve. Uh, I've started to you know, devolve mine to the, uh, you know, to, to the standards and that, but I think a heads up all counselors and that. Uh, I, I know a goodly number have web pages, so uh, let's get ahead of the curve from that standpoint. Okay, this one. Further on AODA and Okay, please. Thank you. So uh, now I'm going to pass to Ken Roberts. Ken Roberts has done a great amount of work for us around the advertising question, and uh, he'll be walking through a series of slides around what our options are. Great. Thanks. Um, as soon as the issue was raised during the summer, uh, what I did is contacted my former employee, my employer, the uh, Hamilton Public Library, and asked if we could have the use of one of the libraries in order to do a complete research. Uh, uh, just a, a search of all the literature to s determine what was out there. So they did it as a, a research uh, project to look at all of the periodical literature to see what was there, as well as all of the web information to see what was there. Turned it over to me, uh, basically unread, but just said, here's everything that exists. And, and I read everything uh, so that we <coughs> could ensure that it was an exhaustive research project that included every piece of research information that was uh, currently available. And uh, I've got that paper. We handed it in November. We can make it available to you. But basically, and as you'll see, we cannot find any jurisdiction in North America where the entire website for that particular organization uh, contains advertisements. Uh, we can say, find ones where portions of the organization would contain advertisements, and we'll get into sort of the details for that. Um, so for example, you can find appraisal offices in the United States or as, uh, uh, but you can't find the municipality that would be there. You can find the Department of Transport in the uh, state of Washington, but not the entire state website. Uh, so there are portions of it that would have or contain some element of advertising. But as you can see, that really there are the four different types of ads. The one that we probably add to that would be directly advertising. And, uh, but it's almost like there you're paying for a service. Sponsorships, where uh, a particular organization sponsors a particular area, will go into each and every one of them. The retail banner ads, which is, I think, the one that council was primarily interested in looking at when we had a conversation in, uh, in July. Uh, the in-house advertisements, where you're really advertising for your own services. Uh, and video ads, 
that should be played at the, at the start of the video. They do tend to take you away from it. They're more intensive and, and they're probably the one that requires the most technological support for it. And it's the one that really at the very, very early stage we sort of took that one off the map and said that one would be the most complex to put on at the present time. And then, as I mentioned, the other one uh, that is an option is the directory listings, where you, you provide some type of a service where businesses have a directory listing and pay for that particular service to be put into it. Um, that one is another one that can be eliminated pretty quickly. Probably the most extensive one that was uh, that cited in the literature is the uh, tourism for the state of Oregon, which lists all of the different types of hotels, eating establishments, all as being a paid directory listing that people could go to that tourism for the state of Oregon and go to those particular sites. So after they net out the amount of staff time, the amount of follow-up time, the accuracy of the information, uh, then for the entire state to operate that particular program, they netted it out as a $25,000 profit. Uh, so it was a, a lot of work uh, for a $25,000 profit when it was their direct business to provide the restaurant and the, uh, uh, the, the hotel listings. So if we were to do a type of directory listing where the likelihood of it having that direct connection, where it's a, a travel and then the hotels, the eating establishments, the attractions, and to be able to net that out as a profit just does not appear to be uh, profitable at that particular point. So really what we're concentrating on is the sponsorships, the retail banner ads, and the, the in-house advertisements as part of it, as being the ones that we can look at a little more closely. And, and I'm happy with questions at any time. Is that all right? That's fine. So the sponsorships, and uh, these are examples from ones that were uh, that are at the city of Hamilton, or at the city of Toronto, uh, and you can see another couple of ones that uh, in the city of Oakville, where the Ten Porches sponsors the free skates and the free swims, and so their their name or the logo is at the top of it. And the same as the one as happens at the city of Hamilton, where you have the Ten Porches to sort of team up and clean up the types of programs where because they're partnered with a particular program, then their logo appears on the, the website itself. And in fact, I think it was at the November meeting that uh, Councilor Farr was here, and he mentioned specifically the uh, Rogers logo appearing on the main page for the uh, City of Toronto. And that was a sponsorship ad, because they do a, a television program that uh, where city staff and politicians appear on that particular program on the table. The, one of the in-kind things that uh, the Rogers receives in return is that they got their logo that talks about the fact that that television program exists on the home page for the city of Toronto. So what we can see from the sponsorships is there's very rarely uh, much money connected to them. They are one of the things that the sponsor receives is a benefit as part of another program or package. So if they're sponsoring a waste uh, program, if they're sponsoring a swim program, if they're sponsoring a, uh, a skate program, then in addition to getting uh, some type of a visible advertising on the site, they would also receive some type of a visible acknowledgement of that in the form of their logo or space on the website itself. Not throughout the entire city website, but just for that part of the website uh, that would be related to the program. So the net result of it is, is that we cannot find any uh, examples where the sponsorships themselves are directly connected to the website. They're connected to the program with presence on the website being the benefit, uh, one of the benefits that you receive. So uh, if the presence on the website adds to that benefit, it may increase the amount of money that a partner is willing to pay for it. But it really should be connected to the program not the fact that you're paying to have your logo put on the website. It could increase the amount of money that you're receiving from the program itself. And I think responsibility for that then would, would reside more within the individual programs that people might be, uh, might be pursuing. And, and I think what you'll see that one of our recommendations is that that part of it should be continued and should be perhaps expanded where it is explicit that one of the capabilities that they really have is to put their logo on the website, uh, particularly those portions of the website that are relevant. Then we get to the retail banner ads. Uh, and 
they're probably the one that is the most interesting, and I would suspect probably for which there is the most misinformation that might exist out there in terms of its, its income potential. Uh, this is one that uh, is from the Washington State Department of Transport, uh, and it's from their road passes. It's one of the ones that they actually do where it's just a banner ad up at the top for the train, uh, for taking the train over the same uh, type of an area. Uh, and you can see that there's another one uh, that we have, and this is from the uh, Cook County Assessor's Office of Chicago, uh, where they have the, uh, the ads over in the corner for TurboTax. It's funny because uh, uh, Jay and I both went to some of the very same sites uh, close to each other, and they're definitely, the ads are, are kind of plugged into your own cookies and what it is that you tend to, to search. So I booked a lot of trips through Expedia, and it was showing me the Expedia sales that were going on at the same time. Uh, Jay's search were different because of the type of online searching and looking that he actually does with those. The one thing that exists with the retail banner ads is being some of the issues and problems connected to them, and maybe the next slide is a good one for that. Oh, this is one even within the, uh, the city of Hamilton, where Tourism Hamilton is going to be attempting to place uh, some of the retail banner ads at the top of their site. And that's a, kind of a pilot that they're starting, but they haven't really started it yet, so we don't have enough information from it. And the, uh, the next one is the opportunity for income is less than you might think. <coughs> and part of the reason for that is the amount of work that is actually necessary in order to generate the ads themselves and the sophistication of the software that's required in order to make sure that those ads are um, sort of geared at the customer as they begin to come through the particular site. So what actually happens is that almost every one of them in the United States can be linked back to a company that sells that ad space in municipalities. And they take 75 to 80 percent of the income. So 20 uh, percent of the income or so uh, goes to the, the organization that is providing the space within it. So for example, the uh, Washington State Department of Transport was anticipating as part of their pilot, and they haven't, reduced, they haven't done the uh, results of that pilot yet, 44 million hits on their particular sites, because they do all the ferry schedules, they do the road conditions, they do uh, lots of very popular sites. So with 44 million hits, which is far, 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 far in excess of anything that we would experience, then they were saying that their income is uh, going to be someplace between 40,000 a year and $400,000 a year. They've uh, actually kind of refined that since that time and that said that they expect their income to be closer to $200,000 a year as income from the department. So um, if, if we were to scale that down, uh, we actually say that the maximum revenue that we could expect if we were to put retail banner ads throughout the entire site would be approximately $75,000. But that does not account, that's, a, that's not a net, that's a gross figure. So it does not account for the uh, cost of managing that particular uh, program or the expectations of it. The net could be considerably less than that. The net could be zero or less than zero. Yeah. Then, similar to Chad's question, then um, what would we anticipate, not understanding like putting these ads on and monitoring and maintaining them, how much staff time could be involved in that? Considerable. Uh, what they are suggesting is, is that you need at least a full-time staff member in order to manage the ads themselves and to make sure that they're appropriate to work with your, and that's even when you're working with a media partner. There is a suggestion in the literature, although we can't find examples of it where it's actually been done, that one way to increase the amount of income instead of using the media partner that's taking the 75 to 80 percent is to use a local media partner um, where it could be uh, CHCH or uh, the Hamilton Spectator, and what you're really allowing them to do is to sell their advertising on the newspaper and then to sell your space in addition to that so that uh, they could expand the ad and, and sell some of it onto your space as well. And if that type of a partnership is there, then the possibility is there that it could be a better split of income from that and you could take some of the income and increase it. But it probably means that you're spending more staff time uh, managing that particular process as well. And it probably means that there is less sophistication in terms of what ads could be filtered through and used, so you're going to have to monitor that considerably. 
Um, what we also found was that in the states, and for example, I'm going to use Washington because they're the ones that have documented their entire pile of cases for the best, is that uh, in the states, you cannot uh, do advertisements on a, a .gov site. So uh, legislation does not allow you to do that. So what they've done is they've moved all of the state of Washington Department of Transport sites to a .com site, and they're, they're using them as a .com instead of as a .gov site. In uh, the state of New York, they actually have explicit regulations that prevent any publicly funded municipality from putting uh, public advertising on their spaces. In the case of Washington, what they have done is a rather extensive list of advertisements that are not permitted. And it does raise the issue of when you're doing the retail banner ads, and some of them could be targeted, and I think that probably one that you would think of that could be uh, logical is that if you had an SPCA and, and you wanted to do it, then, then maybe there could be something like a PetSmart that would be associated with that and pay for uh, some advertisement or some sponsorship as, as part of that particular program. But within the literature as well, you see, a, you see some type of a a kickback from the small uh, business owners who say that we can't aggregate advertise on that side in the same way and that what you're really doing is harming our business by allowing somebody who is a larger player in order to have that particular space which is publicly funded. So there, there does seem to be a number of places where in terms of regulation, maintenance of those regulations, issues that arise, then uh, there's, there's sort of chatter issues, problems, difficulties that are part of that. That problem, which is one, uh, is, which is one reason for using the third party, because the ads, by the time they filter through, tend to be uh, ones that are more bland, but they they really do not include much in the way of local content. Questions of the committee? <coughs> okay, good good shot, but not. Thanks for doing the, the thorough analysis. Yes. Well, the in-house ads, and really it was uh, Jay who picked this one up, which I thought was a really good pickup. That if we want to sort of end it on a positive note, then there's probably one area that we're not uh, necessarily maximizing is the ability to do in-house ads. And again, this is one from Washington State. It was an ad that they threw in really when there wasn't a, an outside party that was willing to pay for that ad space is that they were advertising fairy gear uh, within it, so they're advertising some of their own products, is the opportunity for us to advertise some of our <coughs> own programs, where if there were waste initiatives, if you're trying to get people to, to do more composting, if you were attempting to, um, to, to have more people sign up for swim programs because there's vacancies and there's the possibility of more revenue, uh, if there is the possibility of, of increasing the number of dog registrations, then it's, it would be quite possible to reserve some of that space for advertising. And we think that there would probably be far less citizen resistance to the idea of advertising our own programs and making sure that there was a greater awareness of those programs. March break, that kind of thing? Yeah, Using March breaks, the very same thing that you saw as uh, part of the, um, that, that was there as, as that fold over in the spectator this morning that was part of it. So I think that what we had is a number of potential recommendations, and really what we're trying to do is to build those components of it that would be there with the business case at the end of the day. So we can, we can have the research that is behind it, we can allude to it, we can talk about it, but I think from this particular group what we wanted to do is to say uh, how much time should we spend really beyond this working on developing a retail advertising model. I think our recommendation is that it's not really viable at this time, but we can provide some of the reasoning <coughs> behind that. We can certainly provide the fact that in the jurisdictions where it's been shown to exist that it's not a significant revenue and that there is a lot of staff time and issues and problems that are connected with it. Uh, but we can recommend within that business case that there be a continuation or an expansion of the sponsorship advertising program. It's already working and it, there could be uh, some significant benefits in-house. And it sort of means the software is set up for the possibility of those ads in case there was a change for some of the situations into the future. And that we expand the use of the uh, in-house advertising, or I may have mentioned that one, uh, as well. 
So I think that would probably be our recommendations for those components that would be part of the business case for advertising. Judy? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a, just a comment. Thank you, Ken. Uh, the, very well done. And, and I tend to agree. I think we, we need to take, um, we need to promote our own programs. And, and we have a website that, uh, you know, is pretty static. It's, there's not a lot of visuals to it. So if we, if we can run programs where we're promoting our, our own museums or our own March break or Christmas holiday or even the War of 1812, if there's any merchandise to be sold, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that's probably the better area to look at. It isn't going to take a lot of costly staff time, and uh, you know, not we're not going to have necessarily any direct revenue from the sale of the ad, but the uh, you know the opportunity to sell additional program space and time, etc., uh, would be uh, would be probably a good return on investment. That's it. I was looking at the. Uh the Brampton website just the other day I needed to get some information for a contact from a, from a counselor who had contacted me but didn't leave me any contact information but mm -hmm. what was interesting was that they had a number of little ads and these were for um, for city programs and services and that and and you just and you clicked on it so what was nice it, it, it caught your eye it was visually pleasing and even the one that we had there the one about uh, mm -hmm. about the you know the cleanups and things such as that you know the characters or uh, it was eye catching because it was in color, but you clicked on it and it went, and it linked right to the uh, to the uh, I'm going to call it the departmental you know fax page on that particular thing where you, you got more details and how to how to register for it. So I, I think what you're suggesting here, um, you know, thank you for the analysis um, where it makes sense to have the uh, those opportunities. I think we should explore them. For me, the more eye-catching ability on the web pages, whether it's just the, the individual departmental pages or things like just that that we need to flag, like, you know, green barrels for sale or the compost, uh, the ability to get your compost and things like that. Rather than just a lineage thing, something that's kind of eye-catching, you know, the new, uh, you know, the new, the new calendars, uh, the waste calendars have come out, things such as that, something that will catch your eye that you can uh, then tap on in order to link to the more details and that makes would make our website that much more um, eye pleasing but equally more important more interactive from the standpoint it's, it's it's able to get to that secondary detailed information that you can't encompass in just a little look a little snippet or a, or, or a visual on that so I think we're able to uh, we're able to do both Anything further on uh, on this? So I'm hearing that the recommendations that we're suggesting are the ones that you think we should pursue. Correct. Yeah. I don't think there's any opposition to that at all. Okay. Moving on to the online services. Uh, thank you. And just a just a comment on the in-house ads. We did an estimate using advertising the advertising industry standard of click-through rate conversions, and we estimate that as much as 400 additional sales of our programs could be possible by looking at in-house. Mm -hmm. I mean, very clearly, an lost opportunity, and the one there was the uh, the Washingtons with regards to the ferry items. Is is we have a uh, um, a selective selection of Hamilton items that probably 99.9% .9 of the population don't know are are available at the, not only City Hall but in municipal services. Centers. So I think just that could be a standard, a standard thing there that uh, um, that is is on the white website. Perpetual capitalize on that. So moving into the online services, uh, we had talked at our last meeting about uh, the selection criteria and how we came to those five online services. Uh, so the the selection career criteria we looked at, by and large, the first one was volume. So how many people, how many citizens does it impact? That was sort of the key piece. To so we looked at those top online services. And then within those, we were looking at opportunities to improve customer service. So where there's high use by citizens, do we have evidence that things are not working well for citizens today? Are they calling us with complaints? Are they emailing us with complaints? What can we tell from web metrics about the service there? Also looking, of course, at opportunities to reduce costs and find efficiencies. So there's the component of, of course, 
enabling self-serve as a lower cost channel for us versus phone and in person. So we definitely are looking at that aspect of things. As well as opportunities to decrease print advertising, uh, advertising that we put in the, the newspapers or billboards throughout town. So opportunities to deliver that, that communication to citizens in a more cost effective way. Opportunities, opportunities to increase the use of a program or service. <coughs> so where we want to uh, grow the use of a service, for instance, recreation and our animal licensing, as well as graffiti reporting, those kinds of things where we want to expand the use by providing a good online service that actually works for citizens when we get there. An opportunity to increase revenue, of course, is the other one. That's looking at things like recreation registrations, animal licensing in museums. So it's, uh, it's about growing the number of people that are using those services, and, and some of them have a revenue component to them. So those were the criteria we used, and we did a, a, a looked at our top services, which on this slide you can see on the left-hand side are basically our top citizen services. And then on the right, you can see how we've grouped them. So the, the first uh, six that are there find job at the city, garbage and recycling and museums. We've already done some work in those areas uh, in previous, before the web redevelopment project and previous work. Um, so we've looked at a number of those areas already. There's not a lot, for all six of them, there's not a lot of strong evidence that we have that things aren't performing well. So where we've looked at emails and calls into the citizens uh, contact center, we haven't seen a lot of evidence that says people aren't able to have, be successful in those, in those areas. And they're less connected to revenue, some of them. So finding a job in the city by law enforcement and bids and tenders is not necessarily about our revenue generation. And there weren't a lot of opportunities identified for cost savings in those areas. So it's not to say that we aren't going to look at those areas. We definitely will. And we'll definitely be doing work to reconvert them or to convert them over to a new platform. And in that process, we'll be doing small things to improve those experience, those services. But by and large, we didn't see any significant things that would justify them being part of the deep dive. The next group, the five that we, of course, have talked about uh, looking at in the, in the Web Redevelopment Project, very high use by citizens for these. Several of them are user pay services. So there's sort of a heightened sense of uh, expectation around the ones that we have a, a fee for. Uh, so we definitely are sensitive to that. We've identified revenue generating and cost saving opportunities in, in most of these areas. And there's strong evidence for room for improvement. So we, we do have evidence that things are not performing well in, in all five of these areas. Different kinds of evidence. So sometimes it's about calls and complaints into the contact center. Other places it's looking at the web metrics. Or comparing where there's online transactions and offline transactions. We don't see that there's a good adoption of the online service in some of these areas. And so we think that there's an opportunity to improve the experience, which we know will then increase the, the use of that online service. And in the case of, in particular, business permits and licenses, it's maybe not a top task in terms of volume of traffic, but we definitely know that it's a very high priority service for the city. It's a very important uh, initiative for us. So that's why that can is included. Late addition to this, uh, it's a bit of an oversight, I think, to some extent, but the clerk's minutes and agendas, obviously very high use and very high amount of information in there. And around AODA in particular, there's a lot of strong things that we need to do. So we, we have sort of uh, snuck that one in as something that does need a deep review. And, and we are beginning to work with clerk's uh, team to assess what exactly is required there to improve those services. So that was the uh, criteria, generally speaking. I, to say, though, as I mentioned before, we're not just looking at those five services. That every one of our services that we currently offer today, we will do an assessment of, and we will look at opportunities to improve them. So for instance, uh, things like online graffiti reporting, we definitely want to make sure that that service is improved and that there are no barriers to the use of that. So part of the exercise is looking at all of the services that the city offers and doing an assessment of how it's performing today. How much is it being used online versus the offline channels? And look for opportunities where we can make the online experience better. Uh, so this is just a slide showing the, the five and the six that we have come up with. As I mentioned, the first step is always measuring performance. So some of these areas, we don't know how things are performing today. We have uh, strong evidence that we suggest we don't think things are performing as well as they could be. But as we do our assessment, as we do more work in the area, we do find out that, in fact, the performance is OK or it's strong. It's meeting our expectations. And we don't necessarily need to do a lot of work in that area. Then we will move on to a new application. We will bring a new uh, online service into review. 
but we estimate based on the budget requests that we are putting forward that we have a, an opportunity to look at five in a really deep way. And as we move through the project, we may decide to change one out for another one if we find that there's not a lot of work to do in that area. Mr. Chair? Judy? <clears throat> yes, just uh, before we leave that, Jay, uh, this, is, this is a good shopping list of the services that um, but I want to make sure that we're not kind of focusing inward at doing our analysis, that we're focusing outward as well and getting the feedback from the community. We may look at this and think we're fairly satisfied with, with the results that we're seeing, where there's uh, maybe, um, I don't know this, but there may be frustration outside from our users. And really, uh, I think when we do any kind of a review and analysis, it really is for the people who are using the website is not for us. And so I just want to uh, maybe have some comments on that. Absolutely. Uh, so three, Mr. Chair, the, in, for, in fact, we actually are experiencing this in the review of the HSR bus schedules right now, where we have come to the realization that we don't have a lot of knowledge about how it's performing. We've done the usability testing that shows that there are definitely some deficiencies with it, but we don't have a global picture of how it's performing. For instance, if it's always used by students and the students get it and they're, they're fine with it, then maybe the experiences that we've identified aren't really being felt by that student community. So we have to do a deeper analysis of the performance measures for it, and that involves engaging with citizens in the process. And there's various techniques that we can use. We do review email and, and the phone calls that are coming in. We are probably going to be doing a survey with the contact center at HSR when people are calling into the contact center and dealing with an agent. We're going to find out if they tried to use the uh, online service before they contacted us. Because if they tried to use the online service and they weren't successful, and then they had to call into us, that's that's cost twice for us because they're using both channels. So we definitely wanted where they try to use the online service, we want them to be successful on that channel and not have to contact us in another way. So that performance measure will definitely engage citizens in the process. And there are other techniques that we can use to assess performance at a citizen level. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you for that. Um, it is important because uh, you know I, I would wager that um, many people, not just young people, if they have to make two steps to do something that should only take one step, you've lost a customer. And so they will go on to something else. Um, you know, just even an example up in Guelph, uh, when one of my boys was going to university up there, they could go to a bus stop and uh, have an app and find out when the next bus is coming, just by, just by doing that. So, you know, for a university student who's, uh, or any young professional or anyone who's using an HSR bus system, timing is everything. And uh, they're not going to stand there and wait for 30 minutes if they don't have to. So, um, you know, I, I really encourage that looking at if it's taking two or more steps, let's get it down to one and um, improve our, our customer satisfaction. So, good work. Chad, so, and we have one more slide on the online <coughs> services, right? So, Chad. Yes, exactly. And uh, three, Mr. Chairman, Jay, the, uh, I think in slide 22 you had graffiti reporting, and I think we've had some brief discussions around the mobile graffiti reporting, which could be extended to pothole reporting and all kinds of other issues that people call in. Garbage cans. Yes. <laughs> What's going on left there? Where does that sit in, in this process here? Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. So, our our plan for mobile enabled, the mobile enabled website, is that we are going to make the entire site that we have controlled in our website mobile enabled. Where it links off to a service such as uh, the HSR or the class, we probably aren't going to be able to do those pieces in this work just because there is a much higher level of effort that's required there. We are going to look at that certainly and see what we can do. So graffiti reporting is one of the ones that's inside of our core website and that will be reviewing to make sure that it does work in a mobile device as well. And will that be the same system Toronto has where People are taking a picture at a certain location and it's electronically fed in. They don't have to call, they don't have to email. It's basically they're taking the picture, they're utilizing, I think they have a special app in Toronto that they're using, and it's directly going to the department. Three, Mr. Chair, so I don't know exactly if it would be the same, but it would certainly be the same mechanics behind it and the same principles. And where there's an opportunity to look at a service that's already out there that is working well in other communities, we definitely would be looking at bringing that in instead of creating something that new. Uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, mm -hmm. if that's the more cost effective approach, then that definitely is the approach we want to use going forward. Can we find out how Toronto's fair with theirs? I think they've had it for six to eight months now. Sure, absolutely. I know 
they've been case slashed in terms of it was new to the city. So it'd be interesting to find out whether it's working or not, how much it costs and something. Yeah, maybe the deputy city manager or in charge of finance might be able to do And the three, Mr. Chair, so we it definitely is part of all of the services. Um, and part of the, this is part of the web technology assessment is uh, getting the principles in house about when we would build versus when we would buy or acquire from another community. Mm -hmm. And so we really feel that that web technology assessment will give us a good blueprint for how we do that going forward and certainly leveraging where other communities have done stuff. Ottawa has done some great work, Calgary and Edmonton, if it applies there. And I think they're all starting, we're all starting to look at how we can collaborate together. That's great. Thank you. I, I do think it's important uh, to mention that that's why it's so necessary for us to work with uh, the successful ben vendor on this uh, initial <coughs> consultation process. <coughs> We want to make sure that whatever we're doing moving forward is not eliminating or limiting our possibilities. And, and really, it's the platform, the software that's going to ensure that we can do the ice time booking, the sort of pothole uh, analysis. But if we do that in a way that starts limiting that from the very beginning, then, then we've, we've, we've sort of boxed ourselves into a, a corner. So it, that consultant's report for what's working best in other municipalities is critical at this stage. Further on online, anyone? Okay, transaction fees? Uh, so just oh, the one slide that, uh, and yeah. so I, I believe Councillor Collins asked at the last meeting about how we fare compared to other communities. <clears throat> so when we had developed the list of the five, we did look at other communities. You see Ottawa, Toronto, Windsor, Calgary, Edmonton represented. This slide is specifically around financial transactions, so transactions where there's a you know, credit card or the business that pays for something. So by and large, you can see that Hamilton's fares relatively uh, similarly across the board. There are some communities like Toronto, for instance, where they're doing marriage license or food handler certification online. So there are some communities where there are some services offered, and there are other communities where those aren't offered. And we'll definitely be thinking about this as sort of a, a blueprint going forward about what other services we can add to the mix. Uh, in some cases, we're actually ahead of other municipalities, uh, in, in particular focusing on the so where other communities are maybe have launched a service and not necessarily measuring how it's working, they plug it in and, and they say they offer the service, but is it actually performing well for citizens? And that sort of is the difference with our work, and that's why we are going back and reviewing some that are already in existence, because we do want to make sure that they're working well for citizens before we move on to adding new services. Uh, so I think that that's... So Jay, can I just ask a question about the utility bill? Is I'm just doing this from memory. So I believe I get, I believe I get a paper utility bill. Um, I don't think they offer. I don't believe uh, Hamilton Utilities offers the option of electronic billing. However, I'm on the prepayment program, so in other words, they just plain debit my 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 expenses for the. So that's this is something that's not us. But we need to talk to. Uh, I'm going to call it our uh, our partners. That's, that's correct. And, and similarly with taxation, which is one of the five that we were looking at, there's the e-post version of getting your bill through e-post. So we definitely want to see what the adoption is of that. If we can reduce those mail handling costs, if we can reduce the paper costs, definitely that by providing online service, that's definitely something we want to focus on. I know too. Um, my coach go bill comes electronically. Um, a 407 bill comes electronically. I think that's the only two. And then all my all my bank, notwithstanding I build a bank, don't send me paper things. They still send them send them to me. Um, okay, thanks. Further questions? And so just before moving on, I just want to reconfirm with the subcommittee that the five that we've chosen are make sense and as the five that we will look at and then we'll continue to add more of the And the subject to the continued dialogue is uh, as uh, Judy referred to is as we continue to uh, to consult to do the outreach with the uh, with with the community. Right. If there's things that we need to revisit, go to state bring to us. And, and, er, and early on, I think we want to start bringing now comprehensive measures about all of our services so you have a really good understanding of how well they're working and, and where they may not be working, then you can help 
guide us in terms of looking at those areas. So that's the five plus the four yes. minutes yes. on the agenda, correct? Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Judy. Um, and if I can, uh, just uh, one last question on that. Under under clerks, are we looking at posting our subcommittee agendas? So we're, through Mr. Chair, we're looking. I'd be remiss if I did not ask that. Yes, and we know that that's definitely a strong uh, community request from folks in this room. Just well. ignore the minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so our early discussions around scoping all five of those services would be to meet with staff and get an understanding of where they've received citizen concerns, complaints, and what program, uh, uh, where they're going for their program over the next five years or so. And then and getting deeper in under the covers and finding out exactly what's what's behind that. We'll scope out what we can do in this project and we'll scope out what will be on future dockets for future work as well. So we'll have to do some scoping around what we can do within the time allotted and with the resources available. But certainly that's uh, where we can where there's barriers on the website for the clerk's office providing that information, we definitely want to clear those barriers away so that we can meet whatever legislative requirements as well as whatever community goals we have. Okay, thank you, Jay. And just uh, one last on process. Uh, Mr. Chair, do we need to move the recommendations at the end? We will, yes. Okay, thank you. But I think, I think you know, buying it incrementally yep. is think good, which makes it easier to approve the, uh, yep. you know, the lender recommendations okay. at the end. Thank Jay, continue, please. Thank you. So on to the transaction fees now. So when we reviewed the transaction fee discussion, we had reviewed this because they requested on to uh, BA and any subcommittee quite a while back to look at transaction fees and we prepared the work and then we bundled it into the web development project. So we did look at those same six municipalities as well as a dozen others. Uh, there were several local ones, so Brantford, Burlington, Guelph, Kingston, London, Mississauga. We also looked further afield across the country, so some best practice locations. By and large, uh, Hamilton was actually off charging more. Um, so uh, so where the service was offered, so a lot of municipalities don't offer all services, but where a service was offered, most were not charging transaction fees on services where Hamilton was charging transaction fees. So we were a bit, we were more uh, charging more often on more services. The one exception was parking and POA fines. There was generally a lot of fees being charged across the board there. And primarily that relates to the fact that there's a service provider that most of those municipalities are using and it's part of their standard contract to come in and charge those fees, although that's certainly something we can discuss. And uh, the service provider, in fact, wants to charge higher fees uh, for the service and Hamilton recently entered into, a, I believe, a five-year contract with the service provider to charge at the, the lower level that we had been previously charging. Uh, the other exceptions that we did see out there were museum e-ticketing and animal licensing. So there were some communities that were charging an additional convenience fee for those, but by and large, fees were not really being charged on the services across the board. In terms of Hamilton's uh, mix for this, so uh, recreation and museum e-ticketing did have a transaction fee up until 2010. At the time, I actually worked in community services and the work we were doing in these areas, we recognized that the fee was probably a barrier to adoption of the online services, and we wanted to clear that out. We were receiving a large number of complaints, particularly around recreation, and it, it, especially because the service wasn't working well. So the service wasn't working well, frustration, and we were charging a convenience fee uh, to boot, so people were quite upset. So we did remove them in those two areas. <coughs> Currently, we are charging fees in uh, animal licensing, so there is a transaction fee of $1.86. We were, until very recently, charging transaction fees as well on business licensing and building permits. However, those services recently have been taken offline due to low take-up of those services, and that is something we're going to be working with the business service units uh, to discuss about why those weren't performing well, and that we feel there are other barriers in addition to the transaction fee that we're making those not successful. We definitely want to focus on that going forward. The parking tickets, as I mentioned, is a dollar fifty fee. That is charged directly by the vendor, and then I believe that we receive a portion, a small portion of that that goes back into the parking ticket revenue. And POA fines are three dollars. Uh, the other services where we charge a fee, property information, uh, so the property lookup that uh, real estate and lawyers would do. We are not charging a transaction fee there, in addition. And then bids and tenders, when you're uh, getting the documents from us, we do not charge a transaction fee there. And then the other one that was charged. Sorry, but there's a, there's a fee to go on bid go. Bidding go. Bidding go. There's a, 
There's a fee that's associated with that. That's right. Not a transact. So, the, so a transaction fee for us is an additional fee on top of whatever fee we would charge for the service. So is the administration fee in order to be eligible to? Yeah. Um, Right. So the, the transaction fee in particular, and it's sometimes called a convenience fee, is it's usually between a dollar fifty and three dollars that we've added on. And I actually, the next slide actually speaks to why we do this in some cases. So the original discussion about this back in 2004 was to look at a way of bringing some revenue in to provide for the sustainability of the new website that was launched at that time. So the hope or the expectation was that the transaction fee would help recover costs that could then be put invested back into the ongoing maintenance and update of the website. The annual revenue from the fees excluding the parking, so these are sort of the parking and the POA go into a separate space and so we're not tracking those uh, with this, but the, it's about $7,000 that we've been getting from the fees. And primarily at this point that would be from the animal licensing because primarily that's the one service that is very active online where we are charging the fees still. Uh, and we do have a concern that the transaction fee is actually a barrier to adoption of online services. We've definitely received a high number of complaints and I believe your offices have probably received a high number of complaints as well. Uh, and fees were removed in recreation and museums as a result. And uh, I think certainly we could advocate for uh, looking beyond that. So the best practices as we looked across uh, other communities, so governments encouraging citizens to use a lower cost channel the transaction fee sort of runs counter to that principle and that philosophy. Citizens are definitely aware of the inconsistency of charging an additional cost for online service, especially when that online service doesn't perform well. There can be a very heightened expectation and, and as well as level of frustration. Citizen complaints align to uh, why we're encouraging online uh, servicing. So citizens know that the online service is a cheaper, lower cost channel. It's a very strong awareness in communities. Other organizations are definitely looking at websites to, to lower their costs. So there's strong awareness of this and, and greater frustration as a result. Most municipalities are not charging an additional fee for online services. With some, exception, some exceptions, as I mentioned, around parking and, and POA and animal licensing. Service Canada and Service Ontario currently are not charging any additional transaction fees. And the only research that we could find around this was a, a study done in 2007 around e-government adoption of online services. And they found that 13% or so of municipalities were charging a transaction fee of some kind, probably primarily around those POA and parking. But 24% had encountered issues related to charging those fees. So there is a much higher number of people that have, or municipalities that have experienced challenges. And probably that is why the number is low in terms of who is doing it. I think by and large the trend is removing those transaction fees. Services. So having said all of that, our recommendation around the uh, options for transaction fees, we would recommend <coughs> that the city remove the transaction convenience fees from the city services, starting with the ones where there are no contractual obligations. So parking and POA, because we have an existing contract, we are going to have to think about what, how long that contract lasts and what that might mean in the future. But certainly animal licensing is an area where that would be within our current control to look at removing those fees. We would have to look at the bylaw and the terms of use uh, policy implications. It's just probably something we'd have to go forward to the GIC and Council in terms of looking at removing those. And then we would add an additional recommendation to review the options and the financial impacts of looking at removing the fees for the parking and the POA. And that could be down the road when the contract expires or we could look at potentially what might be possible sooner. But our recommendation probably would be to link it up to that next contract renewal. Chad? Thanks, because that animal control, uh, the uh, animal licensing fee has bothered me for years, and I've been one of those people who have followed my complaints from my constituents and my own personal complaint to the department, and the, the response we always receive is it's, it's a cost, I think, of providing that service. And having sat on the um, call handling review committee, I think we were to the point where, you know, we established what the cost was for over-the-counter service. We also established what it was, what it cost us uh, over the phone. And I think even the correspondence, we might have something for that as well, where somebody was physically you know, putting a check in with a, in an envelope, sending it to the city, and then we were somehow dealing with it at that end. And, and all of those had their own specific cost, and um, and they were all very high. And I think we noticed, obviously, the online ones is the cheapest one. And so I'm, I'm happy with the recommendation to get rid of it. But knowing 
that we offer those services in different ways, and there's a range of costs associated with each of them. Um, so I guess what Jay's recommending is that we eliminate the barriers to participating online. But I, I'm wondering, knowing what those costs are, why we wouldn't create incentives. And so could we not provide a cheaper cost? So if you're, let's say the, the dog license is, um, it's twenty-six dollars a year. Right now, if you're paying online, it's twenty-seven eighty-six. You know, could we not offer something for twenty-four dollars, basically, to, to funnel people to the online service? And, and and we know just based on those other costs that it, we're actually saving by doing that, even though we're foregoing whatever it is, a dollar, two dollars, whatever you choose. So I, I'm anxious to get rid of the, the extra fee, but I'm also anxious to understand what incentives we can provide to ensure that more people are using online services than, than our, you know, our numbers currently show. So is, is that the next step in this process? So uh, through the chair, you have, I think it's agenda discussion item, agenda 5.1 today around amending the terms of reference for this subcommittee mm -hmm. to bring in those two service channels into the mandate of this subcommittee that is the web and the call handling function. Uh, going forward, uh, we would uh, be staff would be supportive of uh, bringing forward information with respect to specific objectives that this sub subcommittee might have in terms of trying <coughs> to develop strategies to transition customers from one service channel, whether it's uh, call handling or counter, to the web. So again, it's in keeping the agenda item 5.1, it's in keeping with that objective that Councillor Collins is reference to service channels and redirecting uh, our clients and customers from uh, and taxpayers from one service channel to the other. And uh, so I know subcommittee is going to be discussing agenda item 5.1, so depending on subcommittee's decision with the uh, amending the terms of reference, uh, you know, if there is some direction from subcommittee going forward, with examining uh, strategies with respect to objectives around transitioning activity from one channel to the other. That's something that staff could investigate and report back. Okay. So I, I like that. And if you need direction of the corporate time, I'd certainly be willing to move it. Based on the recommendations, though, that were just put in terms of removing those transaction convenience fees, we currently have the ability, though, through this committee, through or standing to committees refer. and councils to, to refer that. But there's user by, there's the, uh, the user fee bylaw, which would require right. amendments to it. Mm -hmm. So we certainly have that ability in order to make the recommendations, okay. the adjustments be made to the so user, that today. user fee bylaw. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Mr. Chair, uh, there, there is one area where we actually are doing this, and that's museum e ticketing, where we do have a, a I believe, a 20% discount online service for e ticketing, right? And that sort of is that model that I believe you're referring to. Uh, where we want to look at, obviously, the revenue impacts of lowering a fee online means less revenue. What we could also do is look at um, wherever there's fee increases, we don't fee increase the online service. And that way, the revenue implications could be uh, mitigated. But, and two, there's, it's important, though, to find out what the savings are on the expenditure side, so you have less staff doing less manual work than they would if, if you continued with the status quo. And, and our tax uh, area, that was a strong message for them that when they switched over to the tax, uh, the tax certificates online, which is the 80% of their service is now online, it was a significant cost savings in terms of paper handling. Thank you. Chair, absolutely. On the PAOA and parking, I've been talking to some of my colleagues in other municipalities, and, and they've reverted to, and, and, and they've had kind of the same discussions, they've reverted to the, uh, the old the, well, the GST format, where they have increased the fine in, in both elements, but it incorporates, in other words, it, it takes away the supplemental add-on. It's like, yeah, we're paying $19, or paying $24, plus the 186 or the 150 or whatever the case is. So they've made the move as in the bridging in order to uh, either, they've done reviews or they've stabilized the parking fees or the POAs, but it includes the administrative cost of doing the thing. The net, the net impact is, as you indicated, is, you know, the 150 
some of it comes back to the municipality. So in other words, they've netted out those numbers, increased the fees, which is, a, I'm going to call it, ideally is a disincentive to, you know, not exceed the parking or be in violation of the, uh, of the POA legislations. But it takes away that irritant of having to pay the, uh, the I mean, they're ticked off enough because yeah. either through, you know, misadventure or on purpose, um, they they violate, and, uh, and and then so when they come to pay it, there's a the frustration, and when they have to pay for it with a penalty on the penalty, they're even more frustrated than that. So uh, I can certainly give you the names of some of the municipalities who are evolving there because some of them are exactly the ones you've talked about who are partners to the program for it, and uh, and they and they're taking um, advantage of uh, of. Raising the fees, but it includes I'm going to call it the user component on the on particularly on the on the parking and the and the, the POA. And um, while I've got on the on, on the POAs, um, I was at a conference this week and and actually had conversations two weeks ago with the uh, shortly after he became the new minister of transportation infrastructure. Within within 30 days, they're going to be announcing the changes to the POAs where. We're able to go back seven years and collect. We're able to go back of out a province and uh, and uh, to, to collect on those particular things. I've shared that with Tim McCabe and, and, and Marty Hazel. So well, the news, I think, yesterday the day before. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah, it actually came out of the uh, it, it came out of the Roma. Um, Minister Mc, uh, Murray announced that at the Roma conference on uh, on on Wednesday, and that he and I had, had some discussions. Shortly after he became minister, and that was kind of one of the things that Amos has been pushing. So there's a off topic. There's a uh, uh, a, um, a revenue source, but also that will help us in the in the parking in the POAs from from, from that standpoint. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, okay. So we have the recommendation on that, and there's a work plan at the very. And uh, with regards to the next meetings, and then we'll go to the, uh, the recommendations. Okay. Just on the work plan. Yeah, for you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I know we had some discussion previously around sharing with subcommittee an example of a AODA compliant website. Correct. Uh, I know to Councillor Powers' is reference, I've uh, in the past had discussions with the a uh, advertisement or a graph and have referenced the colors and, mm -hmm. and in terms of how visually pleasing it is and then staff uh, point out that it's not AODA compliant. So it's something we need to be conscious of is uh, how being AODA compliant will affect uh, the visual opportunities we have in terms of uh, the website. So I'm not sure if there's an example where in the future we can bring a AODA compliant website uh, to, to subcommittee so that uh, so the email the email website is currently AODA it has and I ask this they have the ability they've got I'm not, not going to call it the advertising but kind of the the masking blast and things such as that is the masks heads are AOD AODA compliant and the link so so the whole website is totally compliant with AODA. We spent the better part of 15 months on the thing. So that's one that you can go to. And uh, Judy Dizel is the point person for AMO on that, on that particular one. Uh, so yes, yeah, so thank you, Mike. Uh, the next meeting, uh, we wanted to start talking about the new look and feel, and in particular, how it links to AODA and sort of the competing challenges that we're going to try and overcome there. Uh, how you and you can do it. It's just that it takes a bit of an effort, a bit of uh, attention on how that's done effectively. So we'll look at uh, some early plans on new look and feel and what we might be thinking around exploring there, as well as uh, looking at some AODA compliance site. We want to talk to you a bit about the HSR scope and what we envision uh, happening there. We're hopeful that we'll be able to do that at our next meeting, but certainly in the next meeting or two. Um, the complete uh, web technology assessments, we expect to be able to bring forward the information from that in April or May. 
and then a business case. So as we talked about in our last meeting, the business case which detailed the potential revenue and revenue opportunities and cost saving opportunities as a result of this project that would be going forward in GIC in May. And we would want to bring uh, sort of the high level uh, summary of that to this subcommittee before we take that forward in GIC. And we may as well, uh, uh, certainly as when we're talking about the new building field for the site, we'll also incorporate discussion around mobile web experience and what that new emerging experience is like on our website and how that uh, presents a different challenge. But 30% of our visitors are coming through mobile device right now, so obviously very strong uh, growth adoption there. Yeah, well, that's just just um, for, for clarification to myself, um, does, is this the business plan is also going to include apps, is it, to be incorporated into it, or is that something totally separate out of the scope of this? So through you, Mr. Chair, that's great. Right. So we, we are looking at a mobile website, so that's our focus currently. Okay. The issue of creating mobile apps or leveraging other mobile apps that exist, uh, we have some, some input, some, some knowledge that we can share around that, but we aren't specifically doing that with the contacts as well. Okay. There are, uh, the departments are proceeding with pursuits of, so for instance, Tours of Hamilton has their mobile app. I believe uh, some folks in uh, Public Works are exploring something around walkable cities and transportation as an application. So there are there is some pockets of work being done in the departments currently. Okay, thank you. So discussions with the clerk is the, uh, the motion would be to receive the presentation. The, the element is there are a number of recommendations, but uh, Caroline and, and, and I agree they are generic directions. Recommendations require a little bit more body to them and things such as that. So I think you're going to come back to us. I think the suggestion would be to receive the presentation, which means we, we don't have any opposition to where you're going. You'll come back to us at the, the various steps as outlined in the next meetings and where you require specific uh, um, uh, support on things as you build on as Chad's things about the uh, you know about the fees and that they'll go off to the various committees. But from our standpoint, we're looking for something probably a little bit more substance as we go along. But we don't have any problems with regards to the uh, the direction. Chad, so then um, if I use animal license fees as as an example, they report to animal control reports through planning. Correct. So we put. A, Nothing prevents us then from putting a motion to plan to re release. So we're not doing that here, though. Through our yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, they'll 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 go they'll go off. Um, some of them I see going to AFNA. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't preclude, or in fact, it's encouraged that. Can we refer the issue to the committee and, and then from there make the motion? So through Mr. Chair, we, our expectation was that in April, May, when we bring that business case forward, right. that all the recommendations would be part of that comprehensive business case and that we would be doing it at that time. That was our current mode of thinking, but certainly we would be doing the internal work now. If the signals are there to proceed, we'll certainly be doing the internal work to start lining. And, and, and it doesn't preclude councillors kind of getting ahead of the curve in order to have this. I mean, the, the, the fact that we will be uh, um, coming up with this with, with a report, which will find its way to the, to the committee for report, you, you can move ahead on it. But uh, uh, I think, Jay, what they're looking for is April's, be April's better than May so that we can uh, get ahead of the curve on that one. Okay. Judy? Judy? Um, my only question is, and, and, I, and I, I, I hear that most of the recommendations are generic, but there is one that is pretty specific, and that's recommending that the city remove the transaction fees from all city services, starting with the ones where uh, there are no contractual obligations. So that's pretty specific. But that requires a change to the user fee bylaw, which is outside of our, our right. pur pur purview. Right. But so, I'm, I, I'm sensing that if we don't have any problems with that, it will find it will find its way to the to that committee for uh, for consideration sooner rather than later. So that next planning meeting is seven thousand. So just cost, right? yeah yeah just okay so as second we're all on it unless you're not right. no no so yeah but we're we're yeah. on it so yeah. okay no and I'm so, fine with that I just wanted to clarify the process Mike okay. so uh, through the chair just in terms of if the intention is to direct staff 
at the next, or the development of the next user fee bylaw, which typically is brought forward to GIC in November to reflect the, the elimination of the specific fees and charges for 2014. Uh, there's nothing uh, stopping a motion from coming forward at a future um, standing committee meeting directing staff to do so. I just want to remind subcommittee members we brought uh, the user fee bylaw forward in November of 2012 and uh, some of those fees might have been amended and implemented as early as January 1st uh, this year. Right, right. I don't think it precludes Mike that uh, an item be placed on the planning agenda for an analysis, particularly of these ones that are in place, and if the ability to implement change sooner rather than later, so be it. But notwithstanding, I'm, I'm going to say the blended one would show up in the review of the user fee bylaw when it's done annually in November. I'll leave that to the uh, three members of the planning committee and have to discuss amongst themselves how and when it's going to happen. So the motion would be to receive the presentation. Moved by Pearson, second by Collins. On the motion, all those in favor? Carried. Carry. Mike, uh, item 4.2 is the call and in review. So through the chair, you have uh, agenda number 5.1, which is report FCS 13031, uh, which is the uh, web redevelopment subcommittee amendment to title and terms of reference. The intention of the presentation 4.2 is to provide some context to the uh, recommended uh, amendments to that terms of reference. Uh, I know prior to today's subcommittee meeting, uh, staff have met with uh, some of the subcommittee members to provide some of that background with respect to previous work surrounding call handling and Verna Bradford's here with, uh, to join us today and, to, and Verna's uh, here to answer any questions you might have with respect to some of the previous work with respect to call handling. Uh, and to share some of her knowledge with respect to uh, call handling. The, um, in terms of uh, some background, uh, and I apologize if this is information that staff have shared with you over the last few weeks, but the issues surrounding potential duplication and inefficiencies in call handling were raised during the 2009 budget process. Um, from that discussion, uh, staff in the city manager's office led the review of uh, call handling in 2009. There was a uh, standing committee uh, established uh, with respect to call handling review. A uh, external consultant was brought on board to undertake the review and the objectives of that 2010 review were to identify efficiencies in call handling, eliminate any duplication in call handling, and finally to identify possible revenues uh, or opportunities uh, for the customer contact center. Uh, so again, a, in terms of the process, a consultant was hired to complete the review. Recommendations were made for both services and uh, efficiencies and a uh, proposed phased in approach uh, form part of the report from the consultant. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, the the issue around call handling formed part of the service delivery review scope of work back in June of 2010. Uh, it was one of the components of the call handling review. It has been one of the discussion items of the service delivery review strategy team. It continues to be. It's part of SMT's work plan and it's also in the 2012 to 15 strategic plan terms of uh, one of the action items. In terms of results to date, uh, there's been approximately 281,000 in annual savings uh, achieved with respect to uh, the review of the call handling function. Uh, that 281,000 incorporates a reduction of five FDEs. Uh, some of those five FDEs, or sorry, those five FDEs are shared both in uh, corporate services and community services. Uh, specific to corporate services and the customer contact center, some of the reductions were achieved by, uh, by the conversion of uh, going from a split of 90% uh, versus 10% of full-time to part-time to the current split of 60% full-time to 40% part-time. Uh, so I just want to identify how some of those uh, FD reductions were achieved. 
Um, there was uh, a recommendation to uh, develop a quality standard, a uh, call quality standard across the corporation. Uh, staff have acted on that recently. There are 16 staff members across departments, and these are supervisors and managers who have since developed a corporate qual call quality standard. Uh, and they're currently in the testing phase. Um, and I just want to identify what some of the potential benefits of that call quality standard are. Uh, improving customer service is a potential benefit. Reduced call length by managing the call more effectively is a benefit. Reduced number of calls as customer or as callers receive all information in the first call. Uh, consistent uh, citizen service approach is one of the objectives. Uh, improved relationships between the city and its citizens, uh, and improved accuracy, call logging, and information uh, provided. So uh, again, it was one of the um, one of the recommendations from the consultant, and I just want to identify that staff have acted on that recommendation. We actually have buy-in from across departments, and uh, again, uh, representatives, 16 representatives across departments have participated in developing that uh, common call quality standard. Uh, and again, there continues to be work in terms of testing that call quality standard. And in terms of the uh, service delivery review uh, strategy team and their role, again, uh, the, the component around call handling continues to be one of the areas that the strategy team is focused on. Uh, and uh, it was uh, the strategy team who identified the uh, alignment of the call handling review to the web redevelopment project. The fact that uh, uh, both these initiatives uh, represent uh, service channels and uh, subcommittee members had the discussion earlier around opportunities of directing uh, customers' uh, questions or issues from the call handling function to the web as a potential objective of the full web redevelopment. So recognizing those, uh, recognizing the common uh, issue around service channels and recognizing the potential efficiency opportunities of redirecting call handling functions to the web redevelopment, the strategy team recommended uh, that uh, the subcommittee consider amending the terms of reference to include reference to the service channel. So you'll see in report FCS 13031, there is an appendix A, which is in terms of reference. And uh, for the convenience of subcommittee members, uh, the report has, uh, in terms of the text, there are underlined <coughs> text to highlight the recommended amendments to the terms of reference. So in terms of implementation goals, uh, some of the uh, goals that uh, we, we hope could be achieved through continued effort around uh, the call handling function is improving citizen service, eliminating duplication. Uh, we heard earlier today the reference of where customers and clients uh, initiate contact either through web or call handling. They aren't effective and they go to the next service channel being either again uh, web or web call handling. We're hoping to, to eliminate uh, those experiences and to uh, uh, potentially eliminate <coughs> duplication where it may exist and improving the efficiency and improving the experience uh, of the customer or client. In terms of next steps, uh, the next steps of the call handling review is to validate and update uh, the data from the 2010 review with departments. Uh, a uh, feedback we received uh, from departments uh, <coughs> after coming out of phase one is there wasn't a uh, high level of confidence in the, the time that was identified through the review as it relates to call handling versus off-call handling duties, whether that's counter service, duties or other duties. Uh, we're recommending and uh, we'll look to initiate a uh, validation of the call handling function versus the non-call handling function 
and uh, to work <coughs> with the departments in identifying the processes they follow as it relates to the call handling function and where those same individuals may be performing other duties beyond call handling, whether that's counter uh, service duties or whether it's clerical duties as an example. And so uh, again, we're looking for uh, uh, buy-in across departments. Uh, there seems to be a uh, willingness to participate given uh, sub this subcommittee's willingness to consider amending your terms of reference to include the reference to the call handling review uh, and the lovely development. So in terms of, uh, again, next steps uh, is assessing the operational impacts of uh, the non-telephone work, as I've just uh, spoken to. Uh, developing costing and associated benefits and implementation plans to determine go and no go. So again, is uh, based on the feedback of that next phase is to identify any costs associated with implementing any recommendations and also any benefits that would arise from implementing those recommendations. Those would come back to this subcommittee for your consideration and for direction as to whether or not to proceed or whether or not uh, we need to uh, redirect any of our attention or to reconfirm any of our actions or whether uh, so the subcommittee feels there's some needed effort uh, based on the recommendation. So again, there is an opportunity, a go, no go opportunity, and it would be based on uh, some further identification of costs and benefits coming out of the recommendations of the next phase of work. Uh, and again, uh, we would hope that we would report back to this subcommittee, and if uh, this subcommittee approves uh, the going forward option is to uh, report back to council in the fall of 2013 in terms of time. So again, the purpose of this presentation is to provide some context with respect to the call handling review uh, leading into your discussion on agenda item 5.1, and that is amending the terms of reference to include call handling. Uh, review uh, into the, again, a broader scope of work in terms of leverage development and call handling, given that they both represent service channels. Gordon, do you want to jump in here, or do you want to, uh, when we get to the item 5.9? I'm open to questions if you want to uh, okay. ask it. Okay. Chad? I'm good for now. <laughs> <laughs> You were, you were involved in the uh, were involved in the process yeah. and, 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 and so thank you in the committee for, for that. So if there's no questions, the motion would be to receive the presentation on the call handling and then, so moved by Pearson, seconded by Partridge on the motion. All those in favor? Carried. Carried. That's item 4.2. Item 5.1 is the Web Redevelopment Subcommittee, the amendment to the title and terms of the reference which would reflect Basically, the, uh, the the direction that's uh, proposed. Uh, we, we so what's the pleasure of committee with regards to item five point one? I'll move it. Moved by Partridge, seconded by Pearson. Discussion on the motion. Discussion, Judy, please. Um, yes, just just on the report itself, if I can just ask a question on that. At the very uh, last page, three of three of Appendix A, where we talk about the time frame, and we talk about Q, uh, Q3 2012, we talk about Q2 2013, and then we talk about the final report going back to GIC at the discretion of the subcommittee. I'm wondering, because it doesn't have a time frame attached to it, do we want to put something in there not exceeding, um, you know, the end of 2013 or, or something to kind of, we can put a bow around this and it isn't going to continue going on? I, I wanted to just, you know, kind of hear from other committee members or from staff. So, uh, through the chair, reference to the end of two, 2013 is appropriate now we, if this amendment is adopted. By subcommittee, we have two different projects, two different timelines, but the reference to the end of 2013 would be appropriate. That would be appropriate, and that's still we have a go and no go right in here. And, and at what point are we going to have that go and no go? Through the chair again, there uh, we're we're looking at a early summer uh, time frame on the business case on the web. I think 
Jay spoke to May in terms of the business case on the web. So there's some opportunities, go, no go discussions as it relates to the web business case in terms of phase two of the call handling review. Again, it was, was it uh, Verna, third? Third, quarter? third quarter? Third quarter of 2013. So again, the reference to end of 2013, recognizing that staff are trying to bring this information back to subcommittee okay. before that time period. Okay. All right. Possible. So I, I would just offer that up if uh, my colleagues are fine with that. Maybe we should add that at the very end, ideally by the end of 2013. Q4. Mm -hmm. Q4. Yeah. Or yeah. By, by the end of the Q, Q4. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll take that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Maria? And my only question was with regards to the um, the RFP now on the, the contractor that's being so the timelines are all laid out for them that this is the timelines they have to meet also. I'm right. just right. being concerned that there's not a crossover, making sure the timelines are the same. Jennifer? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. So the vendor will, will be setting up shortly once we have a okay. work in hand, and those timelines that were laid out in the RFP will be confirmed through specific work plan discussion. Right. And so we'll discuss things such as the timing and uh, logistics around public consultation, how much time they have to gather current state inventory to do their research about other um, possibilities out there. And so that will still fit at this stage. Uh, and I qualify that until we meet with the uh, successful proponent, but it's still meeting our anticipated timelines for April, so that we'll be back to this committee in enough time to wrap up the business case, etc. Good, that was my concern. Okay. I just wanted to flag that our project will have will extend beyond that, though there is timelines that extend. Okay. Okay. I won't be done. Okay, so on the motion as uh, with a friendly amendment and that, all those in favor? Carried. Carried. Opposed? Um, is there any other items of general information or, or, or business? One thing that I would like, and, and we seem to, with the addition of this, we've added a few more balls to the uh, to the juggling act and that. So it would kind of help me if we were to, uh, as, as I said, I'm a, I'm a visual person, so kind of something kind of showing what's happening, <laughs> when it's planning to, so that we, we, we kind of can keep our eye on what balls in play at the particular time in that. So I mean, there's no urgency, even if that's done, as just said, a flow chart, even if that's done, just done as a, an information item that goes out to the... Uh, to the committee and then comes back as a, as a report, I think would be really, really helpful uh, because um, I think we've, because of the information, we have increased the work of, of, of this committee and that, but to do it justice and that, uh, I, I think the steps we've taken is really good, but I'm just one who's kind of visual from the standpoint of, of, uh, of flow charts. Michael? Uh, through the chair again. Uh, we will bring that information forward, but uh, we will add to that in terms of who our team members are. So if you have an understanding of who are supporting these initiatives and who are available to you, if you have any questions as it relates to both of these initiatives, given that you have a broader mandate now in terms of a broader terms of words. And if the negotiations uh, just kind of firm up with the ideal proponent and that, their names will be added to that, so we kind of know all the players who were involved in it. Uh, and just one final comment, if I may, um, whatever public consultation is uh, happening going forward, I would appreciate uh, just uh, letting the committee members know, and then we can, because uh, I'd, I'd uh, you know, barring all schedule, <laughs> I'd like to uh, try and attend. So, so yeah. through the chair, we'll take that into, uh, as direction, when we work with the consultant, that uh, we uh, determine your availability to participate if you wish. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Any other items of general information or other business? Just to no, Mr. Turner, I just want to ask the, the uh, general public that we're um, seeking information and assistance with on the on the web design. Are these basically people that came to the open house we had recently, or are we are we broadening that through more advertising? Mr. Chair, this this particular piece is strictly around the technology, so it wouldn't necessarily be around the design. It would, and we would definitely let the ones know that they signed up for it. And, yes, definitely. And then we'll be looking at doing some uh, outreach to the best the stakeholders that we know in the community are care of. Good. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Motion to stand adjourned. Pearson Collins on the motion.
Thank you, everyone, for your attendance and participation, as always. Great. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Mr. Chair.